following video interview is part of the USMC VTA History Project, and we're recording at the VTA reunion in Washington, D.C., October 30th, 2015. I'm Rick Lewis. I'm a retired Marine Corps First Sergeant. I served 22 years in the Marine Corps. Um, it was a great opportunity, a great adventure. I served with Charlie Company First Tanks uh, from the beginning of 1966, and at the end of 1966, they realized that if an entire company went home, all that combat experience. So they talked us all in, at least 85% of the company, into extending. Not once, but twice that I did it. And my tour ended in uh, December 1967. Uh, I returned home, um, went to Marine Barracks 32nd Street, married my wife, re-enlisted, and like all good Marines, once you re-enlist, I went back to Vietnam, 6970. Wow. <laughs> uh, I'm here today to talk about my time in Charlie Company, 2nd Platoon, Heavy Section. The incident took place on the 15th of January, 1967, in a providence called Quang Hoi Vang, which is actually to the northwest of uh, Marble Mountain. In fact, it was almost shadowed by Marble Mountain. It was a small patrol base that was used by the infantry almost like uh, an R&R &R center, uh, and they rotated the, the platoons out of there. The night of the incident, Kilo 3-1 was in there. And of course, like all Marine platoons, they weren't hardly at full strength. Uh, the advantage that night was is that Mike Company 3-1 went in to relieve on one platoon. Due to the helicopter scheduling, both platoons were there. Then what took place was Charlie Company heavy section of 2nd platoon, who normally supported 1-1, one -one, we'd come back to pick up one of our mine damaged tanks. It was too late and they decided we would not go back out to 1-1, one -one, which was about eight clicks uh, north of where 3-1 was. So good old cold showers that night, you know, heating up buckets, taking showers, helping each other out, getting a cold beer and getting the rack. Around midnight, all hell broke loose. Uh, everybody immediately got up. Uh, Sergeant Barnashevitz, who was the section leader, told everybody, get on the tanks. So we went out to the tanks, and from the tanks, we could see the red and green tracers firing. We could see the mortars, go, you know, impacting in the area down there. About the time we got the tanks lined up to head out, a captain came out and he stood in front of the tanks and said, you can't leave, that the battalion commander felt that was a diversionary for a major attack on the main battalion. Uh, so we stood down and we waited and waited and we could still see all the action was going on. There were other tanks in the rear for Charlie Company. There was Amtrak's, uh, other grunts started manning the berm around the main battalion. About that time, a radio operator came out with the radio <clears throat> and he said to us, <clears throat> excuse me, you guys need to get down there. They're getting wiped out. They're getting hit by hundreds and hundreds of NVA and they're gonna go down. Sergeant Barnashevitz said, screw it, we're going. And the three tanks took off. Uh, Knowing that they would expect reinforcements, uh, BART led the tanks. We hopped over and back and forth over the MSR, hoping to avoid mines, uh, which success successfully did. Uh, during that adventure, uh, I never thought one could be weightless in a tank, but we wound up going off about a 12-foot drop off the MSR. And uh, sitting in the gunner's seat, it was quite an experience when we hit. <laughs> Uh, we proceeded to the area. As we got closer, it was evident uh, it was not a good situation. We started taking rounds. You could hear them hitting the tank and so forth. Uh, we actually came to a full stop at the entry into the compound. And Sergeant Barnashevitz radioed the tanks and said, we're going over the wire. Now, anybody who's ever been a tank knows when a tank goes over Constantino wire or Bob wire, there's the risk of getting a cotton sprocket. Well, all three tanks successfully crossed the wire. The fire was just too much to put anybody on the ground. 
As we entered the compound, Barnashevitz had our tank, 2-3, Sergeant Sarkrant was the tank commander, go to the right. Uh, Claire was the driver and started talking about, I got to be careful, I have to stand up, look at the dead Marines on the ground. Uh, and he took his 45 out and he was shooting as he was trying to move, maneuver the tank forward as the NV rushed the tank. Uh, Sergeant Barnashevitz's tank went straight in and to the left went Nally's tank. He took that flank. Barnashevitz put it out because there was so much entanglement and hand-to-hand -hand combat going on with the Marines and the NBA and the BC that were also there. He didn't want us firing the 90 millimeter. He, he thought we would do more damage with the 90. So everything was done with the 35. Roy Boyette on our tank, we had still hung on to our M14 and he was on top of the turret dinging away with the M14. <clears throat> Eclair continued to maneuver the tank. As we were maneuvering, Sergeant Sarkrant told me to traverse right. As I traversed right, there was a wave of NVA coming from that flank, and I engaged them with the 30 cal machine gun and knocked them down. And then he kept directing my fire uh, to me in the gunner seat. Then we finally turned on the Xeon searchlights uh, after Sergeant Barnashevitz called us and he was hoping that the searchlights would help blind them because they just kept running at the tanks. Uh, and then the, you could see the NBA running with satchel charges and they would just dive into the, the bunkers and the foxholes. And in the after action report of that night, 45% uh, of the bunkers were destroyed by them. We continued for well over an hour, if not longer, before with the tanks there, uh, we became uh, to the advantage of, of the Marines to finally repel uh, the NVA and the VC outside the wire. During this time as they were going back, uh, we were able to move, maneuver the tank up a little bit closer. Um, <clears throat> we got, had a grunt come over to the tank and said that the listening post was directly in front of us and they had been wounded. We had to get to them. Um, Eau said, you know what, there's just dinks in front of us, I'm going forward. So the tank pulled forward to a part of the wire that had been blown open by a Bangalore torpedo. We were really planning on taking a tank through there. Uh, Ed Boyette jumped off the tank, took his 45 and hauled ass beyond the wire. He went out and grabbed the first Marine, put him over his shoulder, brought him back and put him on the tank. Asked for a second magazine, saw so Cran handed him a second magazine for his 45, and he went out again and got the second Marine and brought him back. For that, he received a Bronze Star. Uh, we backed the tank up and unloaded those wounded with the others that were being uh, gathered together. <clears throat> About that time, we started taking some pretty heavy machine gun fire from the rear. And Sergeant Barnashevitz hollered, they're in the mess hall tent. They're in the mess hall tent. They set up a heavy machine gun. Barnashevitz told his driver to drop, don't button up, just drop his hatch full speed ahead. And with his tank, he crushed the machine gun, the NVA that were in there, and the mess hall tent. No hot chow in the morning. Uh, for that, his driver received a Bronze Star. Throughout the night, things started calming down, and we started gathering our wounded and our dead. Uh, 17 Marines were killed that night and 33 wounded. Uh, luckily, uh, the grunts were able to retain all their weapons, all their guns, their 106, they had a mortar knocked out, the recoilless rifle was knocked out, and two gun positions. Uh, <clears throat> we continued to sweep with the grunts. And finally, when everything settled down, uh, again, like I said, we were gathering the wounded and the dead. Uh, and Eau Claire and I were, were told to get off the tank and, and, and help. Uh, and in one of the bunkers that we were, were asked to help, this bunker, there were four Marines in there with their boots on and their safeties on. Uh, and again, as you can see here, NBA gear, uh, NBA bodies, satchel charges, rifles from them, gathering their bodies, more of their equipment that was left behind. Um, 
this whole incident uh, was written up in Stars and Stripes and published. And even though Sergeant Barnashevitz uh, disobeyed an order and went outside the wire, he was awarded a Silver Star for his actions that night. Uh, as dawn broke and we started to be able to really see the area, uh, the Marines were able to come out of their foxholes and started checking uh, the dead NV the NVA and the VC to ensure the ones inside the wire were in fact dead. Uh, Claire and I got off the tank and we realized there was, there was an NVA in his uniform, just shorts and then the green top on, laying by the sprocket on the right rear of the tank. And I know Marine's got in trouble for this today, but we pissed on him. He stood up. He was bigger than all Claire and I. He'd only been shot in the leg. He spoke perfectly good English. He told us he was being, he'd been educated at BYU in the United States, and when he didn't from, hear from his parents, he worked a tramp steamer to get back into North Vietnam. Once he was there and he located his parents, of course, being a young man, he was inscripted into the NVA. So he's telling us that literally right outside the wire, there are all these NVA dug in the ground. He will take us to where they're at. Well, needless to say, we put the word out, and when the reinforcements came, uh, they sent down uh, some other officers who immediately started interrogating this prisoner. Now, let me just back up to the reinforcements. <clears throat> This place where this battle takes place, anybody and everybody who was at 3-1 knew where it was at. During the battle after Barnashevitz went through the chow hall, the Amtraks called and they were lost. So Barnashevitz, again, telling the other two tanks to stand fast, went out by himself, out into the bush, found the Amtraks and led them back into where we were at. And anybody in tanks knows that's a no so, but Bart did it anyway. That's just the kind of guy he was. So through the night, all this took place. Immediately following this operation, this, uh, that attack that night, uh, Operation Stone kicked off. And uh, I'll leave that interview for another time, but it was an extremely successful operation to surround a complete NVA battalion. Uh, it was uh, NVA Battalion 70. Uh, they never were again ever noted down in, in South Vietnam again after we got done on Operation Stone with them. But this incident that night, several years ago, uh, when I was trying to find more facts about it, I was at MCRD for a graduation and happened to notice on the covers of the Marines, it said 3-1. By pure luck, these guys were with the relieving company, Mike. And they said pretty much what happened is they got in there and Kilo told them this was kind of a cakewalk duty, not a problem. They had the lines, don't worry about anything. And Kilo went and sacked out. Well, obviously the NBA had already planned the attack and had no idea that there were two platoons there. Uh, I think they actually said there was a total of only 67 Marines, which realistically is a reinforced platoon. Uh, but they held their ground, they fought like all good Marines, hand-to-hand, -hand, uh, bayonets, the whole works. And again, like I said, they lost 17 Marines and 33 wounded that night. And I think if Sergeant Barnashevitz hadn't disobeyed orders, uh, I think they'd all lost their lives that night. Uh, I just know when we got there, uh, in fact, that Marine I saw at MCRD uh, said to me, uh, man, when we heard you guys coming, there was no finer sound. Uh, were his words wow. to me, yeah. Um, Rick, did you have any uh, G2 that there were a large number of NVA in the area, or were you surprised by the size of their contingent? They, yeah, they told us later they, they did, you know, they had no idea they were there. Uh, the guy who was captured actually told us it took four months for that, but for that division to sneak all the way down into the Da Nang area responsibility that we were in. And for us, our intel was typically always out at 1-1, a place called the Horseshoe. Uh, Colonel Bell was the CEO of 1-1. Uh, uh, he was adamant about tanks. Uh, we would normally come back in, refuel, hand transfer pump, ammo would fly in, 
and he'd assign another infantry rank and we'd go right back out. Uh, he, he used, and we were the heavy section and literally it was us for months. We never saw the light section of the platoon, had no idea where they even operated. Uh, typical, the way first tanks will spread around. And the unit you left to go to the rescue, did they get hit also or did, were they pretty much left alone at that point? Uh, actually, the battalion was not hit at all. The battalion took, from what we understood when we got the next morning, or the next following day when we got back, they were told, we were told they did take a couple of mortar rounds, but that was it. And, you know, we all got to know how skilled the NVA was, and they probably threw a few mortars in there just to uh, make that battalion commander think it was a diversion area yeah. while they were eating these guys up down there. Um, we were there all the way through the following day into sunset. Uh, when the other reinforcements got in, a lot of the bunkers were being repaired, wire was getting strung, uh, they released the tanks. Uh, and our way out, uh, I had been in the, um, in the gunner seat so long, uh, believe it or not, I actually uh, peed in a canteen and they dumped it out. Sergeant Sergeant Cramp would not let me out of the gunner seat um, till that morning. So when we were leaving, I said, that, hey, I need air. I need to come up and, and sit up on top. So Al Claire again, had been the driver. So Al Claire was sitting up on top of the turret on the loader's hatch. I was standing beside him, and boy, it was driving. And as we pulled out of the, the th Kilo 3-1's area, we weren't even more than probably 100 meters outside, and we hit a mine. Uh, and it was on the left side of the tank. Uh, I was told I was picked up off the ground, my ears were bleeding, and I was babbling like an idiot, which probably hasn't changed much in 50 <laughs> years. Uh, but they put me up on an Amtrak, and uh, the grunts were hanging on to me that were going back, and somewhere between that point and getting back to 3-1, I guess I, I gained consciousness and realized I was on top of an Amtrak and that was the last place I wanted to be was on top of an Amtrak and I tried to get off and the, the grunts were holding me down. Once we pulled back into 3-1 CP, uh, as the Amtraks were on the far side from where Charlie Company first tanks were inside of 3-1 Battalion CP and they just pulled in, dropped me off and somebody grabbed me another tanker and I just remember him saying, oh, let's get you in the dock and of course my ears at that point, everybody's having to scream at me because I can't hear anything. And I just remember Doc cleaned up my ears, gave me two ACP, or no one is aspirin, told me go hit the rack. <laughs> uh, uh, as a result of that, obviously uh, wearing hearing aids today, I had a little bit of hearing loss. Uh, and that's probably what my wife, I always turn around and go, huh, huh. But uh, that was uh, quite a night, uh, and again, uh, uh, we were awarded uh, two bronze stars and a silver star that night. And since that time, Lieutenant Ray, who was our lieutenant, he just happened to be on r during this particular battle. Uh, and he wrote everybody up. Years later, uh, actually about three years ago, he was in San Diego for a reunion. And that's how I found him. And we had breakfast together. And what was extremely interesting, another lieutenant sitting at the table with him was one of the lieutenants inside the wire. His name was Stan. I'll refrain from giving you his last name. I asked him I would like to know what was going on that night. He said, let me give you my name, which he did, and his address. He lived in Wisconsin. And he says, call me in a couple months. I'm going to Florida. So I said, fine. <clears throat> I called him three months later, and he said I was taken to a very dark time in his life, and he didn't want to talk about it. And uh, that was the last conversation he and I ever had. Um, I contacted uh, Jim Ray. He actually retired as Lieutenant Colonel at the Marine Corps. He got into computers and logistics. Uh, he tried to help get Stan to come forward and uh, pretty much his wife said, don't call again. So obviously it is something he doesn't want to remember. Uh, but it was, uh, uh, a major conflict to start off 1967 for us uh, as tankers. Uh, up until that time in the Da Nang area, uh, we had never hit that kind of heavy uh, resistance. It was typical booby traps, uh, ambushes here and there. Um, 
occasionally we'd actually would catch the NBA, or mostly VC. Um, and of course, with the tank, it was to our advantage. Um, we were fortunate on like third, we didn't have the RPG problem till later in 67. Uh, but that literally was the onset of how 67 went the rest of that time. That year, the NBA became very prevalent uh, down there in the Da Nang area. They had in infiltrated quite well. Um, I was supposed to be here t today with uh, several members of that particular crew that day. Unfortunately, um, Greg Alclair is a nut about playing softball, and he tore his ACL last week and couldn't make it. Uh, Lieutenant Ray did not make it. And Sergeant Barnashevitz, I sat down with him last week. His wife is not doing really well, and he just didn't want to leave her at this time. So hopefully at the next reunion, I'll have them there, and maybe we can go back into this, and especially Operation Stone. It was uh, literally uh, a, an unbelievable battle at that time. Uh, we actually mustered 13 working tanks and went into that operation, but I'll save that for the next interview. Uh, Rick, unless you got any more uh, questions for me, that's kind of about it. Yeah. Rick, that's a great story, and, mm -hmm. and again, a tribute to you and the guys for oh. going above and beyond. Uh, I look forward to interviews next time with uh, about Stone, Operation Stone, oh. and in particular to have the rest of your crews here off the other oh. tanks so you get all the perspectives yeah. of the guys who... That's the old guys down in Florida this year. I went down and saw them, rounded them all up. But uh, unfortunately, hopefully next time, they're all here. <laughs> Great. Well, we certainly hope so. Rick, thanks again for all your, your efforts. Um, classic research and excellent presentation. And this is Thank probably you. one of the best videos we've ever done. Pete, thank you, man. Okay.